Piero della Francesca's 1450 Flagellation is a tour de force of realism, scientific perspective, and historical drama. As the inscription in Latin under the throne announces, Opus Petri de Borgo Sancti Sepulcri. This is the work of Piero della Francesca from the village of Borgo San Sepulcro in northeast Tuscany, a phrase to which the image itself tacitly adds, master of all the most spectacular and advanced techniques of today's painting. The picture focuses on the flagellation of Christ in the governor's villa of Pontius Pilate. The perspective lines of the pavement and roof direct the eye to Christ's sufferings, despite the larger size and richer coloring of the figures to the right. Every detail of Pilate's judgment hall is correct, according to contemporary travel literature. For centuries, enterprising guides had shown pilgrims to Israel the actual house of Pilate, the very pillar on which Christ was bound for the scourging, and Herod's palace, quite conveniently nearby. Thus we have the two doors in Pilate's atrium, one open, through which Jesus entered, the other closed, through which he'd be led out. The column to which he's bound, the oval stone on which the accused stood, all historical, according to the guidebooks, though Piero has added a generic pagan deity, the golden figure with a staff holding a silver ball atop the column. Pilate holds a governor's scepter of office, is seated on the curl chair of a Roman magistrate, and wears the tall visored hat of a Byzantine official. It was assumed that Byzantium, last vestige of the Eastern Roman Empire, had preserved all of its historical fashions intact. Pilate wears a skull cap beneath his hat of office, another authenticizing touch. In the Middle East, a skull cap is worn under a turban or kafia to protect the headgear from perspiration. It's actually cranial underwear, though, like our t-shirt, it evolved into an outer garment as well. To the right, we have the Palace of Herod. We see its arch and columns behind the bearded man in the fur hat. Before Herod's palace is the wall that surrounds his royal compound and garden. The buildings to the far right are modern. Christ looks heavenwards, away from his tormentors, his head enclosed in a soft golden nimbus by way of halo. His body is that of an idealized classical nude, His otherworldly gaze could have been extrapolated from the Gospel of John, but his physique is pure Renaissance Italy. His stomach shows a fold of flesh above the navel, for his arms behind the column are held at a height that bends him slightly forward. The executioners are also physically ideal. Their base condition is indicated by their rough, simple garments. The one at right wears what is meant for a Jewish hat, while the left-hand man has common features which suggest his class. He holds Christ's arms in place, and has his eyes on the flail, making sure Jesus is angled to receive the impact. Pilate looks on with severe, beady eyes. Before all four there stands a spectator, his back to us, Semitic by his turban, sole representative of the crowd that looked on. His hand is up in a gesture of disapproval, or perhaps he is already flinching for the anticipated blow. He conducts our compassion and offers a more nuanced view of the Jewish public than any of the Gospels afford. On the right stand three figures, two in modern dress. If we compare the rate at which the paving stones enlarge as they approach the viewer with the size of these figures— we see that the scale is very much out of balance. The time frame is also wrong. The figures on either side wear modern 15th century clothing, a temporal match for the pink building and white tower. But neither the shift in time frame nor scale seems out of harmony with the rest of the painting. So unobtrusively does the central pillar divide it. On the left we have a man with a fur hat, a skull cap poking out from underneath. He has a dark complexion and a forked beard, and wears on his shoulders a robe with ornamental sleeves that hang behind him, clearly a Byzantine. His hand is raised parenthetically. He is in mid-explanation. 
He's listened to fixedly by an Italian man with the cropped hair of a professional soldier and very rich robes of blue velvet and gold brocade trimmed with fur. His thumbs are tucked into his belt. His mind is already made up. Between them stands a barefoot figure in red garments of ancient Greek style. We are being shown a Byzantine ambassador petitioning the Western powers for help against the Turks. It was a request made many times in the 15th century, to little purpose, until at last Constantinople fell to Mahomet the Conqueror in 1453. The figure in the middle is the guardian angel of Byzantium, and he wears its imperial red. In Piero, bare feet represent simplicity and are only found on peasants, saints, and angels. The lack of wings is no argument against this being an angel. It only means he's engaged in his mission, not en route or just arrived. The no-nonsense man at right is Francesco Sforza, 1401 to 1466, and blue is the color of his livery. A great condottiere, or captain of mercenaries, he served Filippo Maria Visconti, Duke of Milan, as general, and finally acquired the dukedom after marrying Filippo's daughter Bianca. A pattern of Visconti roses appears on the wall of Herod's garden in the background. Sforza was regarded as the greatest general of his age, and the obvious choice to lead a crusade to save Constantinople. But this hard-handed pragmatist had no interest in chivalric adventures in the East, especially not expensive long shots like this one. His wife Bianca, however, was a great enthusiast, and she commissioned the painting as a grandiose nudge in the direction of Christian duty. The picture, three feet by two, hung in a room in the Sforza Ducal Palace. The white pavement projecting from the base of the central column and under the feet of the Byzantine originally had a Latin inscription lost to a 19th century restoration. It was line two from the second psalm, Convenerunt in unum, the kings of the earth stood up, and the princes met together against the Lord and his Christ. The line applies to the perils of Constantinople, the enemy kings and princes being now the sultan and his confederates. The typology, that is, the scriptural prefiguring of the Turkish threat, is further emphasized by the flagellation itself. Medieval commentators, including Aquinas, considered Christ scourging the beginning of the pagan persecution of the church. Thus, Piero's concern to place a heathen idol atop the pillar. The menace to Byzantium was to be viewed as the latest act in this cosmic drama. Piero was a mathematician as well as a painter, a great student of Euclid, and his art is profoundly geometric. At the most superficial level, we see this in his mastery of perspective and his quotation of the pointedly proportional forms of classical architecture. But Piero's art is geometric on a more profound level as well. He makes his figures absolutely static, even when they show motion, as if they were statues. What animates them is not the suggestion of motion, but their juxtaposition, which reveals meaning like the angles and sides of a geometric form. In the flagellation vignette, we have five figures drawn together by their roles, Christ who endures, the executioners who inflict, Pilate and the man of the crowd who watch. But they are united from very different angles. Pilate sits with hand and face forward, exacting by his attentive gaze the pitiless performance of his will. The executioners are intent upon their gruesome task, the bystander watches Jesus in pity, while Jesus looks to heaven. No one meets his fellow's gaze. Their roles may parallel or intersect, but every one acts separately, like the lines in one of Euclid's diagrams. Every painter of a historical scene tries to show the mood and motivation of the action he depicts, but in Piero, the action is exactly what is lacking. The figures are strangely still, a quality most observable in the slack-hanging thongs of the flail. It is a kind of visible silence, akin to the wordlessness of mathematics, and this quietude is what gives all of Piero's paintings their hushed solemnity. Amid the right-hand figures, the angel looks out at nothing at all. 
He is not involved in the outcome. He is simply the sacredness of the Byzantine appeal. The ambassador looks off beyond Francesco Sforza. He sees the hopes his hands help him describe. Sforza looks directly at the Byzantine, determined to see only what's really and immediately before him. Piero has not frozen the motion as a camera would, but shown all the actors in irrevocable poses, existential stances. He has painted not deeds but decisions, solitary decisions that balance one another in a kind of moral geometry. <laughs> 